Trilobites are really well documented in the fossil record, with over 20,000 named species. But for a long time, there's been some parts of their anatomy that we just haven't understood because it's soft tissue and it doesn't really get preserved. Occasionally, you do get things like antenna preserved when the body's been replaced by pyrite, but even those are part of the exoskeleton, they're just so small they're normally not preserved. So, still not a great help for those soft tissue parts. However, new fossils coming from Morocco do have some of these soft tissues preserved, which is really, really nice. The specimens are of two already known genera of trilobites. Protolinus and Gigotella have this soft tissue preserved from some fossil sites in Morocco, and this is the first time it's ever been known to have the soft tissue. One example of soft tissue that isn't actually totally new is going to be the stomach tract, and that's because we have at least some partial ones, including one from a trilobite that was found just a year or so ago that had some of the stomach contents preserved, showing that it ate brachiopods and things, brachiopods being clam-like animals that were really common in the Paleozoic and still exist today, just not nearly in the same kind of diversity. This blue section in Protolenus is that digestive tract, and you can see how the stomach kind of starts first curving upwards, and then it goes back into the intestine, and then all the way out to the anus, where it would excrete its waste. This makes a lot of sense, it's kind of what we would have expected based on the very simple body plans of most arthropods. This is kind of just how they build their digestive tracts, it's not shocking to find this. But it's nice to have a really good one preserved, so we can understand it hopefully a little more. Maybe there's people who are really, really good experts in digestive systems in arthropods, and they can look at that and make some better ideas about what they might have been doing and why their digestive tract was the way it was. But for what we know right now, it's pretty much what we expected. Interestingly, though, Gigotella does have brachiopods associated with it, but not inside of it the way it was in that other fossil trilobite. Instead, these ones are actually on parts of the carapace, meaning essentially they would have landed on the exoskeleton and started growing there. Those are these blue structures on this CT image. It's also really interesting to think that potentially if this animal shed its carapace, those brachiopods would have stayed there, and then potentially more could have also made that carapace part of their home and anchored to it, potentially being able to cause entirely new reefs to start growing from just a few different carapace of different trilobites. As for the actual soft tissue, we can look at the legs, because there's these little lines coming off of them, and it's been suggested before, based on some other fossils, that potentially at least the first upper segment of the limbs of trilobites may have had gills, but it turns out they go a little bit further than that, and that basically every leg had its own set of gills. This is how these trilobites would have breathed, by walking through, or potentially even swimming, although seemingly not very well, through the water column, and being able to pick up oxygen from the water. And finally, there's some of the mouth parts, the hypostome and the labrum. The hypostome has been found in some other ones, and it's basically the moving mouth part that would have been able to crunch things up. If you're thinking about the brachiopods I mentioned that had been eaten, that's essentially what would have broken those up so that they could be eaten. However, the labrum's really interesting, because most arthropods have it. There's a few groups that don't, but those are exceedingly rare and live way in the deep sea. They're just very strange. However, in this case, it's essentially what makes up the upper lip, very loosely, of arthropod mouth parts. It helps to cover the mouth hole, because in arthropods, the mouth is basically just a hole that things get absorbed straight through, and then it has extra mouth parts around it to help push food into that. Think of Anomalocaris, where it had these giant arms that would have helped shove food into what was basically just a round hole in the middle of the head that it would use as its mouth. The labrum basically just helps to cover that, and it really helps to highlight how things like trilobites really were a lot closer to modern-day arthropods than things like Anomalocaris were, where Anomalocaris just lacked this trait that's pretty common and pretty ubiquitous throughout arthropods. This labrum is also really useful for helping us understand other arthropods' labrum, though, because there's been some debate about whether or not the labrum came from part of the digestive tract, or if it was actually some set of limbs that became this feature in order to help with feeding. And that makes sense when you look at other arthropods. For example, you can look at the chelicerates. So scorpions, sure, they have the pedipalps, the big pincers for eating, but they also have a smaller set called chelicerate that are right by the mouth and are also used for feeding. In spiders, the chelicerate are the fangs. And if you even just look at things like wasps, you can see there's a lot of mouth parts that are moving around there to help the organism eat. And those could have very easily come from limbs rather than parts of the digestive tract. In this case, though, it seems like the labrum, at least, did come from the digestive tract. So this fossil is really helping us understand how certain traits in the arthropods actually evolved. 
Now, in Pompeii, the people would have already been dead, and then a big pyroclastic ash cloud would have come in and suffocated the bodies, covered them up, and the heat from that ash would have essentially just vaporized the bodies, leaving these cavities where people could later go and pour plaster inside of and see the outline of the body. Same basic concept here, except it was an underwater pyroclastic flow. What that means is it wasn't necessarily as hot and would have cooled much quicker, however, it still buried these fossils, and then because of that, they were able to essentially have the outlines of many different parts of these organisms. And because of that, we can actually see some of that soft tissue. And again, this is all due to CT scanning where they were able to take some of these blocks, put them in through a CT machine and see densities to see what kind of structures would have been there. So really unique preservation type, really fortunate that we have it so we can start figuring out more things about trilobites because... We know that there's a lot of them, we don't know that much about their early evolution, and we're starting to get there, hopefully. Again, really interesting find, and hopefully there will be more, and potentially there's even other organisms preserved the same way that we might be able to find out more about.